he probably was the most active person in the convention in the, that had supported CONCON. I think he was felt bad he didn't get to be elected president because he'd had the, the most credentials supporting. However, I think as a president of CONCON, he would not have kept things glued together the way Steve Nisbet did. I think he would be the, the CEO wanting to get things to move his way. Now, the main criticism I had, there were two. One was he was strong for civil rights, and he had a good record. But to me, it was a very basic civil right on apportionment that you're very familiar with, that it takes six people in Detroit, Democrats to equal one Republican. I think that's a basic violation of civil rights. And uh, granted, it has a political impact. But uh, George Romney would not go along on this at all. In fact, uh, I was very disappointed. The other problem I had, and it may have been my fault as much as anything, is George would not listen. Now, I think of other people like, well, Steve Nesbitt, Ed Hutchison, well, D. Hill Break. Uh, we all had very congenial conversations. We may not have convinced each other. Bob Danhoff, uh, well, you've been on panels where Bob Danhoff and uh, Glenn Allen and I have been, and uh, they were CONCON delegates later on the Governor Romney staff and the Court of Appeals judges that we all on a personal level got along. But I think George would make up his mind and just that was it. Now I remember a couple instances, one that, uh, you know, Adelaide Hart was the caucus chair, we called her the den mother, very wonderful person. She taught music in Jefferson School, which is in the ghetto area. And George said to her once, well, all you need to do is get the family around the piano. Well, many of her students, she said, didn't have parents, let alone a piano. And she kind of said, shook her finger at George and said, well, you just don't know what's going on. Well, there was just that inability to listen. I know one time he said, well, I was just a special interest CIO. I said, what are you? And I said, look, we have a pretty good record on civil rights, ecology, education so that he had that, I'd say, inability to listen. Now, I know when, uh, with Men and Williams, Adelaide Hart, uh, she, she was really something else. She and her, her uh, school teacher fashion would go and shake her finger and say, Governor, your staff isn't telling you what's going on. They got you cotton batteries. I want to tell you what's happening. And Men and Williams would listen to her. Now, I don't know if George Romney had anyone that, that did that with him. Now, I think often when he made his decision, like the gas scuttlers and the Vietnam, he made the right decision and charged right ahead, but I got the feeling he, he had great difficulty in listening to, to other people. Maybe I was the one. I may have been abrasive, and uh, he knew uh, where I was coming from on apportionment, and for some reason, uh, he was convinced his way was the way to do it. To, you kind of equate people with so many acres. And, uh, and I, I think later on the U.S. Supreme Court said we were right that uh, uh, con con, I said we ought to quit offering people unconstitutional constitution. That always kind of got under his skin, but uh, it turned out the U.S. Supreme Court agreed with me. Tom, as, as the Democratic leader in, in con con, did you know from the get-go that, that uh, Romney would challenge Swainson in, in 62? <laughs> I don't know, and I would say if he built citizens for Michigan to become governor, I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, the one indication was we were talking about income tax. Well, Williams had tried to get it through. Swainson had tried to get it through. One of the disasters of the Williams administration, which I didn't agree with, was having a payless payday in the hopes of getting an income tax. Well, that boomeranged, and I want to be clear that the governor did not always follow my advice, and mine was not to do that. But what was happening was he was coming out in the con con uh, for an income tax, not graduated, uh, not graduated. And I think it was oh, several of the delegates said, well, if you want that, why don't you go across the street and get a few Republicans to vote for it, and we'll get it through. And he would not budge on that. Well, that gave me an indication that he was more interested in the concept than he was in getting it done because I think he could have walked across the street and got enough Republicans to go for it. So that was an indication, but I emphasize that 
if he wanted to use Khan, Khan is a springboard to, to be governor. I see nothing wrong with that. Uh, Ed Hutchison used it as a springboard to get to Congress. Uh, my good friend uh, Bill Ford to get to the state senate and uh, uh, Daisy Ellett to the state legislature. So I see nothing wrong with the only thing that I would be critical of is his primary concern was the income tax. I think he could have walked across the street and helped get it done. Tom, for our viewers, tell us a little bit, where was the CONCON held? Well, it was held in Lansing, in the, that civic center there. Any, any recollections about you know, the physical arrangement? Oh, they weren't bad. Uh, Jim Hare had Bernie Abel in charge of that. And we, well, we got our own parking spaces, and we had the, I'd say it, and I'd say the group itself was a very congenial group. And I think each reunion we had were more friendly. In fact, uh, George Romney was the last reunion. We wrote a letter, Dear Georgia, Dear Tom letter, and uh, uh, I, I was very glad that we had that rapport. Tom, did you meet often with Governor Swainson during uh, the Adelaide, uh, Adelaide Hart was a den mother. And uh, I can tell you this story there. She and I would meet with him once in a while, or really nothing profound. Uh, we did talk about the income tax and some things like that, but there really wasn't much uh, impact one way or the other. Tom, you told us about uh, apportionment being one of the battleground issues yeah. at the Constitutional Convention and perhaps the income tax. Any other issues stand out in your mind? No, the apportionment was the main one. It suggested unsuccessfully that we separate the vote on that from the rest of the Constitution because I think on balance, except for apportionment, it was better than what we had had. And I'd suggested that, uh, well, Dick Van Dusen, uh, he was a floor leader for the Republicans. Steve and I had mentioned it casually. Uh, George Romney, we never, we never got the report to talk about it. And I think that would have been a good thing to do because it just barely passed as it was. And uh, there's a matter, should the highway commissioner be elected or appointed? Uh, the Pollock approach uh, was a political science to have. Well, I said that they just wanted the choice of three from civil service to be governor, they appoint everything. It's a little <laughs> exaggeration. But uh, there was that uh, conflict, really not the Democrat-Republican so much as they call themselves the county gang, the D. Hale Brake. Uh, rural area as opposed to the George Romney suburban one. Now, D. Hale break won out, but partly was because of the apportionment that uh, the uh, urban areas around that uh, Romney was with didn't have the representation based on apportionment the ones that D. Hale break and Ed Hutchison had. But they maintained county government. Township government was written into the Constitution. Tom, is there any uh sections of the Constitution that you can turn to and say, well, that's the Tom Downs in I got two. Okay. One of them was, you may know their recorded votes in committee. Now that happened, I'd be uh, talking to legislators, maybe nine on the committee, seven, Tom, I'm with you. They'd vote secretly. You know how many votes I'd get? Maybe three. <laughs> Each one said, well, I did. I don't know who didn't. So I got that part in. Then uh, the other one was on the confirmation that in 60 days, if you aren't rejected, you're in. And I think that gives a little stability that I could stand uh, waiting three and a half years, but it would be a turmoil within the agency, guys, one is in or out. Then I did work on the, with Gail Wanger on the one against capital punishment, but I'd say the two I can put my finger on are the recorded roll call vote and the 60-day provision. Tom, let me ask you uh, uh, some observations on some of the individual delegates yeah. that uh, Bill Marshall. Yeah, Bill I liked. Bill shot from the hips, but the one time uh, uh, he was vice president of the AFL-CIO, and one time uh, John Martin, who was a Rhodes Scholar, was up speaking. Well, John was kind of a very, you know, well, uh, prissy's the wrong word, but very, you know, well-dressed and so on. And, Bill got up and said, I'm a Rhodes Scholar too, but I've driven on every one of them. <laughs> well, Bill had a good sense of humor. Uh, he shot from the hips, and uh, I, I was very fond of Bill. And he, uh, he had a real good guts reaction to things. 